So in this video, we are going to bring together the concepts we've been discussing in our last few lectures uh, and connect that to sort of have a full understanding of how transmission lines respond to digital circuitry. Um, and so let's kind of consider where we are. So in a digital system, we might be trying to send a signal much like this top ideal um, pulse, which is uh, some nice sharp rises and falls. There's a frequency associated with that. So every certain amount of time we'll get either a rise or a fall. Uh, and this is sort of a kind of ideal conditions. But in reality, uh, because of sort of mismatches on the transmission line with the load and with the generator, uh, we're going to get these back and forth reflections, that ping pong game. And that uh, can lead to a few different effects, but the most damaging one is probably ringing, which is this oscillation back and forth that eventually settles out as each reflection back and forth dampens and weakens the wave, but it takes some time to do that. Um, so ringing is, is obviously very detrimental since if we think about the digital circuit as uh, basically being a discriminator that takes the halfway point and anything above that point we call a one and anything below it is a zero. If we apply that to this signal that has lots of ringing, then we're gonna see all kinds of false flips that aren't real, that are only a product of the ringing. The other problem is that we may well be exceeding the voltage that would actually destroy our electronics to begin with. Since we have a five volt system and we end up with more than 10 volts going into this, then um, we may actually be destroying or, or degrading tra uh, transistors over time. So there's a few ways to deal with ringing. The first is to decrease the frequency. If we decrease the frequency and we slow everything down, then these uh, sort of plateaus here are much longer and we give our circuit more time to settle out and, uh, and dampen the ringing before we flip to the next ball. So that will help. Uh, the other thing we can do is we can shorten the transmission line. If we shorten the transmission line, then each back and forth reflection is quicker. And so this oscillation will become faster and it will settle out even faster as well. Since the faster we can get those reflections, uh, the more we're going to take advantage of the dampening that occurs each time there's a bounce back and forth. So we can shorten the transmission line. The third thing we can do is, of course, we can tune the transmission line. Uh, we could try to have a better match between the load and the source, um, or, or, or between, uh, sorry, between the line uh, and the load and between the line and the source. And this is going to dampen those reflections. But we only have a limited ability to control that. We've got a transistor. We've got transmission lines and traces on circuit boards. There's only so much we can really do. Uh, so in many applications, uh, turning down the frequency, the, the, the first one, is not so much an option. For example, in 5G, where the emphasis is on going to very high frequencies, tens of gigahertz. So there's only so much we can do with uh, option two. Um, and it, the, the first three, the first and the third, there's only so much we can really do to help that, given that number two may be constrained. Uh, and so we'd like to think about a way to uh, optimize the performance even if we uh, sort of de increase the frequency. So uh, the third may be, okay, we've dealt with ringing and we've reduced it enough. And so now we've got sort of a, a nice reaching of steady states before we reach the next bit flip. Um, but ideally, you know, you might turn to your manager and say, well, that's great. I'm glad you, you uh, got that ringing out of the way, but I don't need, I don't, I'm not good enough to, uh, two gigahertz. We need this to be four. So double the frequency right now and then come back to me. So when you do that, you'll be running into the limits where rigging is happening again, and you no longer have that, uh, um, that extra slack to reduce the rigging, and then you're kind of stuck. So you can think of this as a circuit that never actually reaches steady state. And the question is, how do you analyze the way the circuit board is going to respond or the way your transmission line is going to respond in cases like this where you never actually get steady state? So let's take a look at that today. All right, so let me just draw a generic circuit right here just as we've drawn many times before. All right here is our source that has voltage value VG. And we've got a generator resistance. And we've got a switch right here that connects to a transmission line. So we close that switch at T equals zero and it connects us to the line and there is a load at the end of this transmission line. This load could well be the um, input to another transistor, to the gate of another transistor that kind of activates uh, you know, that, that gate. So that's how we could represent it. Um, and at T equals zero, we might close this switch. 
And if we bring this over to a bounce diagram, it's sort of a generic bounce diagram that we can draw that might look like this. We're going to start out with an ejection of voltage VA. I'm going to call it VA, going this way. And we know that VA is simply the generator voltage, and we're just going to apply a resistor divider between RG and Z0. So this will be times Z0 divided by Z0 plus RG. All right. And now we also know that there are reflection coefficients on both ends. This we've been calling gamma L. And this we've been calling gamma G. And so I'm going to draw that reflection and return to the source. I'm going to draw it in blue because it's now going the other way. So this voltage is VA times gamma L moving this way. Let's keep that going. I want to um, stick with the rightward going way being in green. So this value right here will be VA times gamma L. And now we're multiplying it by another gamma G going that way. And let's continue this on. This value voltage right here is VA times gamma L squared times gamma G moving that way. All right. And this, of course, is t equals zero right here at the top. All right. So uh, in the last lecture video, we talked about uh, the definition of V positive, right? And when we've reached steady state, V positive at steady state will be the summation of all positive going waves. So we're going to take this VA. We're going to take this VA right here, and we're going to take this uh, VA times gamma L times gamma G. We're going to take the next one, sum up all of those green waves together, and that's going to give us the value of V positive. It's all the ones in green summed up. All right. By the same token, V negative in steady states will be the summation of all negative going waves. So if we take VA times gamma L, and we add to that VA times gamma L squared times gamma G, and we add to that every single blue wave that we're going to have, every single negative going wave, and you add all those contributions together until infinitely far into the future when you reach steady state, that's when you're going to end up with the values of V positive and V negative that we came up with in the previous section, which is that V positive equals um, VL plus IL C0 divided by 2, and V negative equals VL minus IL C0 divided by 2, right? If you, if you add up all the green waves to eternity, you're going to get the same thing as V positive. If you add up all the blue waves out to eternity, you're going to get this value of V negative, right? But that's steady state. But um, really, we should think of this as if V positive is building up slowly and V negative is building up slowly. If we wait long enough, then a few things are going to happen, right? So at t equals infinity, we're going to have V positive on the source side equals V positive on the load side. We're also going to have V negative on the source side equals V negative on the load side. Right, so the voltage is now everywhere the same along the transmission line, and it's equal to these values that we talked about in the last lecture. But that's a t equals infinity. But let's look at how v positive and v negative actually builds up. Right, so let's come back over here. Let's say we want to plot what v positive is as a function of time. So this is v positive. So at any given moment, this will be the summation of every single positive going wave that has occurred. And this is V positive at the source. All right, so what's gonna happen is at T equals zero, it's gonna jump up and it's gonna take on the value of, whoops, uh, it's gonna take on the value of V sub A, right? And then at some time, two T into the future, it's going to change very suddenly and it's going to take on the value of VA plus VA gamma L gamma G. We're going to add up those two contributions. So it's VA plus VA gamma L gamma G. 
and you can keep going again. This will eventually become VA plus VA gamma L gamma G plus VA gamma L squared gamma G squared. So every time the wave goes by, we're adding another term uh, to it um, for each of those reflections. And all of those are going to sum up in, until we reach our steady state value. By the way, I, I wrote this as if we're increasing, but it doesn't necessarily have to increase. It could oscillate back and forth depending on what the, um, uh, the signs of gamma L and gamma G are. All right, let's do the same thing for V negative. All right, V negative is going to jump up. Uh, it's gonna stay at zero for a long time because there has not been a negative going wave that has reached the load until we get to two T. At this point right here is 2t. t is the one-way propagation delay. At that moment, this goes from being zero volts and it jumps up to Va times gamma L at 2t. It's going to stay there until 4t, which point is going to jump up. It's going to be Va times gamma L plus the next wave that's going to go, which I didn't show in that bounce diagram, but it's going to be VA, got a better A, VA times gamma L squared times gamma G. And this is going to continue until V negative approaches um, its steady state value. So now let's deal with the situation where in this circuit right here, we're also going to close the switch, right? We're going to close a switch at T equals, uh, let's say 2.5 T, right? So after two and a half one-way propagation delays, we're going, to re we're going to open the switch again and therefore remove the generator and its resistor from the circuit, All right? So um, in that case, the way we're going to treat this is we're gonna follow the exact same process that we talked about in the last video in terms of looking at V positive beforehand and V negative beforehand and looking at how the, the, the flip in that switch is going to affect V positive and V negative and calculate the difference. What's going to be different is that we're not going to use a steady state value of V positive or V negative. We're going to use the current value, the, the value right now at this moment. And so if we take a look at this, um, two and a half T is going to be over here, right? This is the moment when we disconnect the generator. And so now let's ask the question, just as we did before, uh, which one is going to change, V positive or V negative? And since we have a disruption at the source side, V positive is, is going to change. V negative isn't changing because that's coming from the load and nothing has changed at the load. But the value of V positive is going to change. And so let's write this down. All right, so we've got before and after, and we've got V positive and V negative. All right, let's just make a little table here. All right, so V positive, uh, the moment we flipped that switch was, sorry, before we flipped the switch was VA plus VA times gamma L times gamma G. And V negative was VA times gamma L, all right? After we flip the switch, we've just decided that V negative is not going to change, right? So that's still gonna be VA times gamma L. But let's think about what happens to V positive. All right, two things happen when we, uh, remove, when we uh, remove that generator from the, from the circuit. The first thing that's going to happen is VA is gone because we're no longer injecting that initial VA into the circuit. The second thing that happens is this reflection right here of VA gamma L is now reflecting off of a different reflection coefficient. And so we're gonna get rid of the VA and we're gonna have to change the second term because gamma G is now has a value of one, right? Gamma G nu equals one. And so the new value of V positive will therefore be VA times gamma L, right? So um, remember, we've gotten rid of this VA right here. We've gotten rid of this gamma G. And what's left is VA times gamma L, 
just get rid of that since it's not corrected before. All right, so now let's take a look at, by the way, um, the delta. So the delta V, the change in the voltage will be the change in V positives. So this will be V positive old, sorry, V positive new minus V positive old. And this will be VA times gamma L minus VA plus VA gamma L gamma G. All right, so we're going to take this value right here and we're going to inject that into our bounce diagram. And so at, at two and a half T, we're now going to inject a new wave traveling this way. The value of that wave is going to be this change in, in voltage right here, VA uh, delta gamma L minus uh, VA plus VA gamma L gamma G. So that's, I call that delta V. So let's just write that in right here. This is delta V. And that's going to be propagating down that line. And we can just take this right here and trace it back and forth and continue to follow it. So this will be delta V times gamma L traveling this way. And this will be delta V times gamma L times gamma G going that way. And this is going to, is going to continue. All right. Now, bear in mind, this, this wave right here, this VA gamma L squared gamma G is going to continue as well. Right, that's going to keep bouncing back and forth. It's going to bounce back and forth with whatever the reflection coefficient is the moment that it reflects. And so this reflection that I'm now pointing out is going to reflect with the coefficient of um, positive one since it's now encountering an open circuit. But it's still going to propagate and you still have to keep track of it. Right. So in the notes, I have an example, sort of a um, let's show that this really matters kind of example. And I'll set it up here, but uh, you can see the details in the notes. Um, and so let's consider a little microprocessor inside of a computer. And the microprocessor here is one centimeter by one centimeter. That's its physical size. Now it's reasonable for propagation um, uh, to be about a third or so of the speed of light. So let's say that... Uh, um, our propagation velocity is one third the speed of light. And let's just say that that is uh, um, 10 to the eighth meters per second, right? Uh, let's, let's try to figure out to what extent this is gonna matter. So frequency times wavelength equals propagation velocity. And from that, we can get that the wavelength equals 2.5 centimeters if the frequency is four gigahertz, all right? Four gigahertz is a pretty typical uh, frequency for microprocessors these days. Um, and so that corresponds to a wavelength of about 2.5 centimeters given this propagation speed. So one centimeter is very significant. That is definitely much more than 10% of the wavelength. And so we definitely need to take into account um, uh, transmission line theory here. Um, but let's, let's kind of take a look at this, right? So we may have a, a scenario like this where we've got a square wave pulse. And this distance right here from rise to rise is one over four gigahertz, which works out to be about 200 or exactly 250 picoseconds. And the length, sort of the, the, the half pulse is there for 125 picoseconds, all right? Let's now consider the propagation delay from the center of this microprocessor to the outside, All right? That's gonna be uh, 0.5 centimeters divided by the propagation velocity. That's gonna be our delay time. And that works out to be, if you do the math, 50 picoseconds, All right? So let's take a look at this. What 125 picoseconds basically means is that we can have one way, the other way to make 100, and then another 25 picoseconds. So looking at, looking at this in terms of a bounce diagram, we're basically turning on the, uh, the digital circuit. We get 
propagation this way, we get propagation that way. And by the time this signal is halfway there, we're already flipping the circuit off. So now this is the off time right here, in which case we're gonna have to inject a negative. Uh, when that happens, this blue is gonna keep going back and forth, the wave that was launched by the on, but the off pulse is going to be injected and that's gonna keep going back and forth as well. Uh, there's an example of this in a note, so you can, you can kind of see how this looks like in a bounce diagram. But the point is that if you are operating at a frequency so high that your circuit never reaches steady state, then, then you have to calculate V positive and V negative a little bit differently, um, but continue to keep track of all waves that have been injected in the circuit um, as long as you need to until things settle out, right? So that should hopefully give you a more complete picture of uh, how we can push the envelope um, and keep track of how digital circuits respond, particularly for extremely short transmission lines and particularly for um, high speed circuits. Um, and uh, in, in the next uh, lecture, we're going to be sort of generalizing this a little bit and uh, talking about loads that aren't just resistors, but have uh, some capacitance or inductors. Um, and that will sort of complicate this picture a little bit more. Um, and uh, we will cover that next.